Please put your hands together and welcome Charles Cecil. Well, firstly, thank you all. What a brilliant, this is such great, isn't AdventureX brilliant? Um, so many people who love adventure games uh, and interactive narrative all together. And so it's a real privilege and a pleasure to be able to talk to you. Um, I have been writing games for over 40 years. Um, and right from the very beginning. And I'd like to start with just a little um, recap. But the, the reason that I've written this is that obviously, you know, when I was writing games, which was in the mid 90s, it was very much in its heyday. And the, the genre has declined. And we continue to write adventure games. Uh, we continue to write expensive adventure games. And each time I look back and try and work out what, what should we be doing next. And the key thought at the moment is antiquated interface or outdated user experience. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. But to begin with, I want to be just a little bit self-indulgent uh, and talk about my early days. Um, this is a Sinclair ZX81. It was the first uh, computer that I wrote uh, my adventure games for. And it had 1K of memory, which, and I know this is really patronizing, but I love doing it. This has 256 million times as much memory as we had back in 1981. Um, and, you know, of course you can go, well, that's rubbish, isn't it? I except that to put it in context, it, was, it had the same power and it had the same memory as the multi-million dollar computers that just a few years earlier landed the astronauts on the moon. So you can imagine how incredible it was at that time to be able to harness this, this power. And, and, and it was extraordinary. And the way that we did it is, this was my first game, um, very, very unimaginative, entitled Adventure B. Um, it is a text adventure. Uh, the fifth line down, you, say, you can see that Kant should have an apostrophe. Um, a wonderful uh, member, one of our fans, pointed out that Chisel is not spelt with a Z. My spelling was absolutely terrible. We became a little bit more, um, a little bit more um, professional um, and um, produced proper artwork. Um, but anyway, it was great. But this is all the subject of a different talk, but just self-indulgent, but I can't help myself. So, um, and we used to meet, this is me back in the, uh, um, in, in, in the early 80s, uh, and we used to basically <laughs> sell, sell our games um, at crowded halls um, with wonderful, wonderful fans, uh, all through mail order, and that was what that. Then in Revolution, uh, then I co-founded Revolution in 1990, uh, and we started the company specifically to create a new type of adventure game. Um, this is what our publisher got us to do. Um, <laughs> Uh, it was, I mean, just, just trust me, it, 80s, it was kind of part of the whole, um, you know, new wave of, uh, it, it just was, uh, the, 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 gentleman, the gentleman on the right is uh, a Mr. Tony Warriner, who, like me, looks distinctly older and more grizzled, um, although I hope that, um, I hope that, <laughs> I, I, I hope, I hope that, um, you, you know, but anyway, look, look at him, he looks like he's straight out of an 80s pop band, absolutely brilliant. <laughs> Um, the, the game that we're best known for, um, or the, the series that we're best known for, is Broken Sword. Um, here's the first game, Broken Sword Shadow of the Templars, with a few screenshots. That was released in 1996, um, and that was then followed in 2010 with a director's cut. And what I'm going to talk to you about is the up of our first game, Broken Sword, which is something that we're in the process of doing at the moment. We have the most wonderful community. They are loyal, um, they love the games that we write, we love them. Um, it's, it's an absolute pleasure to be, you know, particularly since you hear these awful things about other communities. Um, so we're very, very lucky. And the two things that they always ask for um, is when's there gonna be a new Broken Sword game? And also, when are you going to um, publish the Broken Sword games on new platforms? Uh, and I felt very, very passionately that we would need to wait to upscale and address some of the issues. And part of my talk is to convey that, 
But part of it is also to talk about the research that we did, the user research, and what we found. And, you know, the original Broken Sword had 30,000 frames of animation. And we found that it took about an hour for an artist to redraw, um, recolor. Um, 30,000 hours is hundreds of thousands of pounds. So the decision on whether to move forward with this was a really, really, really important one. Uh, and I'm delighted to say that we, we decided to, uh, and as I say, I'm gonna share with you some of the uh, findings that we made along the way. I mean, one of the key things for anybody who is a developer, you will find that publishers really don't like adventure games. They don't like them because they don't scale. I'm not quite sure what that means, but anyway, apparently <laughs> they, they don't. Um, and, you know, they're expensive to write. But do you know what I think they really don't like them for? Is because they don't suit non-fungible tokens, <laughs> in-app purchases, and loot boxes. <laughs> I mean, I, and people have said to me, well, can't you just redesign your adventures so that you've got loot boxes, so you've got in-app purchases? I'm too old. I'm too old, and I don't want to. So, uh, so we're, we're, we're moving forward. So basically, the question in, uh, sorry, and uh, he here's the game, uh, Broken Sword, Shadow of the Templars, Reforged, going from the original resolution of 64400 to 4K, which is an increase of 36 times. So it's a phenomenal change. And the question that I, uh, oh, oh, thank you. Um, and what I wanted to do is just show you very briefly, um, it's only a two minute video, which is, showing what the game looks like now compared to what it did before. So here we go. We put so much passion into this intro, and then it was compressed, and uh, it was palletized, and it's just such a pleasure to be able to go back, because this is what we kind of always imagined it was gonna look like. Um, As I picked myself up, all I could hear was the ceaseless drone of traffic. So, dynamic light rim, dynamic shadows, dynamic lighting, all the sorts of things you'd expect. The leading article but referred to the visit of a Nobel Prize winner from some unpronounceable Eastern European state. I'll stop that. Um, but for anybody, if anybody is a, a Broken Sword fan, I, I promise you that there's a complete respect for the law of the first game. So, uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain some of the changes that, that I've made in, in, in a moment. But first of all, what I want to do is to um, talk about uh, the game. Um, I, I went through it too quickly, but uh, on the Apple App Store, Broken Sword Director's Cut has a Metacritic of 91%. Um, on the Google App Store, it's 4.7. So it kind of, it's, it's a game that people like, right? It, it, it should be obvious, and everybody knows how point and click work. So we were making some changes, and we thought we'd put it out to test. Uh, our, our average score, oh, our average score came back. Would you play this game again? Two and a half out of five. And these are, these are gamers. These are gamers who play other types of genres on, on, on platforms. So it's not like they don't understand the grammar of playing video games. Is it fun? Three out of five. Would you recommend? Three out of five. Um, and that was a real shock because this was not what we expected. Um, and so we, we accelerated the, uh, the testing, the user testing, um, to try and get to grips with exactly why people were having trouble, why people who were experienced gamers were giving us such a poor score, because it should be obvious, but all the people giving us good scores are adventure players, they understand it. And if we want to go wider, we're, sh we're surely to God gonna have to make the interface accessible to people. Now, um, I'm gonna focus on the, uh, the mobile version. And, and the reason is because that's probably the most complex interface. And everything ev that we learn from that comes across to the PC and, and acro across to, to, to console. Now, 
some of you, in fact, I imagine quite a lot of you who are adventure fans are going to be horrified by me talking about what we want to change. So just to be clear, we will have a story mode and a classic mode. Uh, and everything that I talk about now is in the story mode. Uh, and if you like a hardcore adventure like it, like it has been, like it is at the moment, then obviously you can go for the, the classic mode. So, first of all, um, the hint system. We um, at Revolution, when we, when we wrote a Director's Cut, we're, we're one of the pioneers in putting hints into games. So, uh, I'll just show you a very quick clip. Um, this guy's stuck, he gets his lipstick, he, I mean, like, you're, you're desperate, you're using every ass, everything on everything else. <laughs> So what we can do is we can go and you can go, uh, this is what you're meant to be doing, I can't unlock the door. So we'll go for hint one, um, and it'll give you that, and then you're meant not to go, but this person has, he's just got, you know, gone for hint two. So, um, and, 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 and then they continue. So that's all very well, except that the moment you go and you look for a manual hint, you failed. And you feel like a failure, because ultimately, what you want to do is you want the satisfaction of having solved it for yourself. And what we found, which was really worrying, was that when people solved it for the first time, uh, sorry, when they, when, they when they accessed the hint for the first time, then actually they just kept doing it. And because they kept accessing the hint, it meant that they weren't getting the satisfaction of the challenge, and they gave up on the game pretty quickly. Which which is a really, really important of psychology. And I've, I've kind of written this down because I, I got it from the internet. Um, humans are contradictory. We're hardwired to follow the path of least resistance, but we're ultimately unsatisfied we, because we, when we do so because of the challenge. And that is at the heart of it. People think that they want to go as fast as possible and then ultimately um, get frustrated when they do. So we put a lot of thought into this, and the reason I'm telling you all this is not to try and you know, talk about how brilliant we are, it's I hope that some of you who are writing games will find this, this is useful. But our solution is actually to put in um, an auto hint system, which kind of sounds awful, which, which basically flashes after, when we think that you're stuck, it just gives you a gentle flash. This has come straight from casual games. Uh, in fact, I was, I was inspired um, by Candy, well, I don't play Candy Crush, but I was playing it for some reason. And, and <laughs> uh, honestly, nobody believes the word I say. But anyway, all I can say is that when I was kind of getting a bit frustrated, just a little, little star came up, click me, click me. And it wasn't patronizing, and it allowed me to move forward. And so I wanted to experiment about whether we could do the same thing in the adventure games. So this, by the way, has been turned on to maximum um, maximum hint level, so to give an indication. But ultimately, it starts with a little hint, and then it gets a little bit more, and then we give you the answer. So here, if we play this, you can see that um, the solution is to go into your inventory, get the dart that you've picked up, and use it on that lock. So while you're doing something else, it leaves you in peace. But as soon as the gameplay returns, it's now telling you what to do. Now, just to be clear, it would have just been giving little hints to begin with. And now, it's just do it, come on. And, and, and it, it, it goes as far, at this stage, at the maximum level, of basically telling you what to do. And all I can say is that when people do this, they don't feel patronized, which is great. Because ultimately, I want people to play this game without ever having to resort to go to the manual hint. Because the moment they go to the manual hint, they've basically failed. Now, I do feel that um, we, we, with Beyond a Steel Sky, we, we had a debate about whether hints should be on a timer. And personally, I wasn't enormously enthusiastic about it because I thought that it, it frustrated a player's legitimate choice to access help. But having seen the way that if people resort to hints and they keep going, I actually think it's a really good idea uh, because we're doing the auto hint which, as I say, means that people shouldn't need to ever go to the hint. So we are going to put timers on to try and just drive people, to nudge people to keep playing the game, even when they um, have to uh, admit that they've uh, failed the first time. Also, looking at the video, there were so many little things. I want to give you just one pretty trivial example, but of many, that gave us the opportunity to, um, to just tweak the way that the game played. 
So here is um, the original uh, game uh, running. Uh, it's a bit of a crappy video, but um, I wanted the finger because it, it shows. As the finger goes over, can you see the, it, 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 it covers the, it covers the hot spots. So you don't know for sure actually what you're, um, what you're clicking on. Uh, and we'll go, will be another one here. There you go. Can you see that actually it's really quite confusing what it relates to? And so what we've done, and I have to say, I think this interface, I'm very proud of it because we, we were one of the first adventures to come across to, to touchscreen on the, on the, uh, on the iPhone. And, and we very much pioneered. So I, I'm not kind of beating ourselves up with a, with a stick. But, but at the same time, what you can do is look back and see how it can be improved. So what we do now is you can see that there's a cone. And the cone uh, indicates where the hotspot's coming from. And also, we trigger it just slightly earlier, and slightly earlier again, and slightly earlier again. So it's quite clear what it refers to. It's a very small change, but it has a profound a change on the way that people uh, understand the game. The other thing, you know, for PC is I feel that, um, you know, so much of the interface comes forward from the 1990s when we had low resolution screens. And while I know, you know, a lot of people like the idea of it looking pixelated, um, if we want to appeal to a new audience, I think it has to feel and look contemporary. Uh, and I'd like to think that, that, that this does. Um, but, but staying absolutely true to the interface that works so well for the games that, that we love playing. I'm going to show you one more, and, and I really shouldn't even need to do this because it's so obvious, and I feel stupid doing it, but I'm going to do it anyway. And that is, you know, a proper tutorial done by somebody, created by somebody who has experience in this field, um, which is, is all about minimizing the amount of text, minimizing, showing stuff graphically, Showing stuff, uh, and, and, and as I say, this is, it's ludicrous that I should even have to show because it is so obvious. But in many ways, we do assume that people can play point and click games, and so normally we don't bother with all of this stuff. So we made all of these changes, and I mean, I wouldn't be sitting talking to you if it hadn't had effect. But what's interesting is would you play a game, again, goes from 50% to 90%, and would you recommend? goes, oh, I'll do the fun, because that's even better. That went from 60% six, to 90%. Would you recommend um, from 50% from to 80%? So a huge, huge change with not that much work, but a rather boring job, I have to say, of watching, multi which many of us did, of watching people play the game for half an hour um, and really, really trying to get into the reasons why people were having the problems that they were. Um, so I'm really pleased with that. Uh, the other thing I want to show you is, uh, and, and as I said earlier, the, for, for those who are fans of this game, uh, and thank you for those that are, um, everything, is a, everything that gets changed gets changed for a good reason. And I want to talk a little bit about, if I can bring this over, here we go. I want to talk a little bit about the uh, continuity and the continuity logic in the game. Now, for people who've played the game, you may know that um, it starts when somebody dressed as a clown puts a bomb on this stool here. And yet this start of this game, it's a bit dark, has the, this untouched and the, the bomb there. Now, this doesn't really matter, except it does. And, and the reason that it does is that when people play games or when they watch films, they're looking for inconsistencies in case they move the plot forward, or particularly in an adventure game, they're related to, to, to the puzzles. So just a little thing, but as you can see, what I've done here is I've asked our artists to actually make it look like it's blown up. Nothing else has changed. There's no reason why anything else should have changed. And if I now go to this one, um, and we come over here, and this, is, this, is, this has irritated me for 30 years. Finally, <laughs> finally, I can sort it out. George pulls this drain pipe and says, uh, the clown didn't escape over the rooftops. 
Well, of course he didn't escape over the rooftops because the, 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 the drain pipe doesn't go far enough. So it gave me so much pleasure. Thank you, thank you. It gave me pleasure, and, and, and I'm glad that you can see. Uh, and I know it's only a, a, a small thing. Um, and again, I'll just mention very briefly, there's a point where the assassin goes back to the hotel where he's staying, and he's wearing a jacket, and George gets the trousers from the wardrobe. So the player's going, oh, 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 you know, subliminally, well, he must have been back. Well, he must have been back because he's taken the jacket, but, but why didn't he change his trousers? All of these things go round and round. So the, the, wh how, how wonderful it is to be able to make these changes that are to do with continuity um, and, and hopefully will make the game more satisfying and more logical to play. So, so um, I, I'm going to rush through this, but I would like to talk briefly about... Whoa, oh, I know. If I got rid of that, that would help, wouldn't it? There we go. Uh, ooh, click on this. Don't, don't worry, it's because it's not, it's not highlighted. So, yeah. Fantastic. Great. So, generational, uh, I'd like to talk briefly about my opinion because ultimately, you know, the, 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 the punchline of this is, of course, going to be talking about a new generation of gamers. But, but let's, look, let's look at Gen, Gen X, first of all. People who are in their 40s, good proportion of us in this room are, are that. Um, some people think that Gen X goes up to about 59, 60. Uh, I'm absolutely convinced it goes up to 61 because I am not a boomer. I am definitely, <laughs> I am definitely at the cutting edge of Gen X. <laughs> and, and these are people, uh, we, we are people who love adventure games because we played them uh, as probably our, our first video games because back in those days, uh, and Richard Cobbett actually wrote a very interesting article about this, and the fact that back in the, back in the, you know, in, in, in the 90s, um, adventures were the cutting edge of technology. Um, and, and we played these games, uh, many of us were in our formative years, um, and so we, we bring forward uh, an, an emotional um, resonance with, with these games. And then we have millennials, who I used to think were so young, but millennials are in their 30s now, and it's, yeah, it's terrifying. And these are people, um, many got drawn in through, well, many of them actually got drawn in playing games like Broken Sword with their parents. And what makes me so proud is when people write to say, I played it with my parents, and now I'm playing it with my children. And, you know, there is nothing better than that. Um, there was also a new generation with games like Professor Layton, um, um, or, or people just could have drawn in um, because they, they discovered the, 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 the genre. And again, there's often a, an emotional uh, resonance. So, um, you know, those, those, those two groups, and then there's a third group to which we need to be eternally grateful, uh, and that's Germans. Because, <laughs> honestly, honestly, the Germans, you know, I, when I do my press tours, I am always astonished at how incredibly well-educated the Germans who play adventure games are. And uh, I can see Jan there. Um, we, we thank you, because, you know, <laughs> Um, it's, it's, it's really, really important. But let's talk about Gen, Gen, Gen. I call it Gen Z. And, and Wendy told me that everyone's going to laugh at me. But we're English. It's Z. It's not Z. But anyway. Anyway, I, I did promise her that I would point out that I knew that really it's meant to be Gen Z. And I'm just being difficult here. Sorry? Oh, Gen, great Gen X. Yeah, but X is not quite so difficult. So the big question is... Will the game appeal to this generation? Because they are quite different to the rest of us in the terms of the games, the, the fact, oh, five minutes left. Ooh. Um, I'm hoping there's going to be a bit of time for, for, um, for questions. So I'll, 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 I'll accelerate now. And um, we, we, uh, I, I love giving uh, young people the opportunity to do work experience. Um, I always pay them, by the way, because I don't think you should get people in for free. Um, and um, how, how, how fantastic to get young people, 14, 15, to come and play the game. Uh, and I'd like to finish by quoting um, a young fellow called Archie, bright young gamer, um, typical, played the $100 million games. Um, 
discovered that, he, I asked him to play this, he didn't even know that this type of game existed. And what he wrote was, the game was a pure joy for me to play. While there were points I was stuck at, completing puzzles on my own felt very rewarding and satisfying. My unfamiliarity with the genre led me feeling as though I was discovering video games for the first time again. And that filled me with so much confidence. And so my, my argument really is that we do need to adapt the user experience, but without turning our back on what makes the genre itself, the simplicity of point and click and the complexity that then emerges from that. I mean, a lot of people talk about cozy games and indeed adventures should fit absolutely into the, the cozy game movement. People who want to play games in which time doesn't matter and in which you can take time to dream is what I, uh, I'm told. And ultimately, we want to leave people feeling smart. So, qu question, ant an uh, antiquated interface or outdated us user experience? Um, I, I hope very much that for our game, and, for our, and please don't think I'm lecturing on what you guys should do, but for us, it's the case of taking the interface, really looking at where people had problems, addressing it, and it would seem that we were able to do that pretty um, effectively. Broker Sword uh, launches in early 2024. Um, I, maybe the good people of AdventureX will invite me back next year, um, and I can talk, amongst other things, about whether my confidence was in, in the genre um, was well-founded or not. Um, but uh, anyway, we, we, we will have to wait and see. So um, that's basically what I wanted to talk, talk to you guys about, and I wanted to leave enough time for questions. Uh, we can do one. Alistair's feeling very generous. <laughs> so well, thank you so much. Dave's hand went straight up. Hi. Oh, um, gosh. Oh, you, know, you promised Hi. me you weren't going to heckle. You promised. <laughs> My voice is shot, so I'll sound more silly than you. But uh, no, I was just wondering, you talked about uh, getting all these testers uh, to play the game. I'm just curious where you got those testers from. Ooh. Were they all online? Did you bring them into the office? No, they, they were online. They were online. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we, we thought we'd be very clever, you know, we thought we'd be very clever. So the reason that the gameplay is from, for those of you who play Broken Sword, it's from Broken Sword 2, because we thought we'd cover our tracks. We thought nobody will know what we're really up to if we put out Broken Sword 2. But in this, for, for, for mobile, uh, it was called um, Cloud Test, Cloud, Cloud Test something or other, and it is phenomenal, and what you can do uh, if you subscribe, is you can be very accurate about the, the demographic you want the game to go, because they've got huge numbers of people. Um, we're, we're too mean, and also we don't really care. What we want is a, a spread, so we just ask it to be you know, more generalized, which I think is probably more, va more valuable. It, it's, it's set up, these are, these are set up specifically for free-to-play games, but we found it incredibly valuable. Um, and I believe that we, there, there, there are equivalents for PC where you, 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 you load it onto Steam. Um, so just, I, I can pass on the details if you're interested. But, 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 I mean, I didn't know that these things existed until a, a friend of mine, actually, what, somebody that we're working with, um, Bobby Farmer from EM Studios, ha, had used it for one of his games, and he pointed it out. And it's just, it feels too good to be true. And it's not enormously expensive either. How many uh, people would, do you think tested it all together? Sorry? How many people do you think tested it all together? We, well, 15. Oh. And, and, the, and the, reason, the reason that it's such a low number is because my feeling is there's no point in asking people to test unless you watch that video for half an hour. So if even 15 people is seven and a half hours. Yeah, seven and a half hours. So, so, so the, the, the point being that you, you know, we, we could have had more, but then all you're doing is getting data. And, and what we're interested in is, is, is the experience and understanding the experience of why people went, you know. Thank you, that's interesting. Thank you. And I'm afraid that's all that we have time for. Please uh, join me in thanking once again Charles Cecil.